here yet. Uh, Tim Pentreath, most of you have probably heard of, passionate pilot, flyer, videographer, adventurer, and an undisputed fly sky high fanboy. He had a great chat the other day, which I thought was brilliant. But he's really embraced, embraced this whole Volv Biv thing to the extent that he's featured on Cloud Based Mayhem with uh, Greg, uh, Gavin McClurg, which was, uh, which was a really good session. So without further ado, Grab a beer, everyone, and um, over to Tim. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the introduction. Um, it's nice to be able to share share my passion with with you all. Um, I know there's a few other Volbivers on here, but let's hope there'll be a few more by the end of it. So I'm going to share my screen. So yeah, this is what it's all about. It's uh, yeah, Volbiv. Um, one way of looking at it is uh, cross country without retrieves and it's liberating as I hope you'll uh, you'll you'll discover um, during the course of the next hour or so so let's uh, let's press on so this this is what we're going to talk about just where it all started a little bit about me quite a lot about some of my trips talk about kit um, the Gumball Transalps rally which you may have heard of um, a little project that Reese Fisher and I are putting together, the Volbiv Safari, and talk about some resources. So, yeah, that was a rather nice spot um, at the northern end of the Dormiers, and we'll come on to that. So, yeah, how did it all start, Volbiv? I think it started in about 30 years ago with this French guy, Didier Favre, who did first of all a 444, a cap 444, and a 444 refers to the kilometers. He flew 444 kilometers or traveled 444 in 1992. And then he did a, a much bigger one, 1,111 kilometers in 1993. And this involved lugging his uh, hang glider up the hill, then he would leave it, then go back down again, get his kit and walk back up again. So pretty hardcore. And, um, He's obviously quite a character because here he is in flight. This is genuine in flight. If you if you find this video on YouTube, um, you'll see him opening a bottle of champagne and then drinking it out of a glass, um, which is quite something. And I don't even think he, he spilt too much of it. So a little bit about me then. Um, I started flying bloody ages ago, 1990. And I was evidently a bit of a slow learner because it took me 10 years to do 50K. And then it took me a further 11 years to do my first 100K. And just for a laugh, um, we'll have, I've got a little video clip, which I'll play you now. Some of you may have seen it already. Yeah, so that was, uh, that was, again. let's go back. Yeah, so that was after 21 years of flying and it was, uh, you know, I guess I hadn't been trying that hard to do 100 kilometers. You know, the secret to doing 100 kilometers is actually going to a site where it's possible to do 100 kilometers. So that was from, um, uh, uh, oh, what's it called? Liddington Hill, just near Swindon, down to, uh, down to near um, well, Little Hampton, actually, yeah. So yeah, that was a that was a classic. Even if I did slightly bust airspace on the way. Um, then my PB so far is two hundred and twenty, um, which yes, bloody hell, six years ago now. Um, it feels a long time ago. So I really want to do another two hundred k, one of these one of these years. I've done lots of British Open competitions over the years. I've been an advanced XC serial team member and um, 
and then ambassador team member since 2014. And so I get to go out to uh, meet the guys in advance every, well, I say every year, but it's, it's been a bit uh, curtailed last year and probably this year. Um, and I'm also, I've been importing XC Tracer Varios since 2016. And with the current CAA rebate, it's been pretty busy, I must admit. Right, so that's a little bit about me. That's my first glider on the left, um, obviously, the Harley Contrail. And then I've got, a, I'm flying a Omega X Alps 3 at the moment, um, which is just a, just a little bit of a step up in, <laughs> in performance. Right, anyway, we didn't have that. So yeah, let's, um, let's talk about some, some of the trips I've done. So my first full boob was just a, a one-nighter in 2016 didn't do anything the following year. 2018, I did a, oh, that, that first trip was with just, uh, was with Nigel Cooper, who used to live down in um, St. Andre. Then together we did a, a sort of tour around the Ekrins, which is this area here, um, together. And then 2019, the sort of precursor to the gumball. We started in St. Andre and there was four of us. And, uh, I ended up in Andermatt in Switzerland, so about 500 kilometers. I had another little bonus one in end of August, um, early September, and this was uh, flying to an advanced team meeting. And I've always wanted to do this little trip. It's about 150 kilometers. Um, and it was meeting up at uh, Spitz for the advanced team meeting. Well, it wasn't actually a team meeting, sorry. It was a it was a party to celebrate the success of Kriegel and Patrick and Tomer and, um, oh God, who was the other one? Uh, can't remember now, we'll see in a minute, um, in the in the X Alps. And then finally, uh, last year, did 800 kilometers over the course of 10 days from, again, from starting in St. Andre, ending up, uh, pretty close to Bassano del Grappa. So yeah, let's just run through some of these and I will, uh, you know, I've got a few slides for each one. I, I'll rattle through them and um, try and recount any amusing stories or anecdotes uh, or particularly happy memories. But I mean, this one, I flew, got up super early in the morning, uh, flew from Bristol on the seven o'clock flight, arrived at Nice at 10, and I was met by, um, I think Marcus gave me a lift, Marcus King. Um, drove me up here. No, 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 I'm completely wrong. No, I was actually staying in uh, St. Andre for a few days with Nigel and we drove, his partner, Carol, drove us down to uh, uh, Calder Blaine and we started there with a, there was a bunch of American guys staying with them as well. Um, but only Nigel and me would, would vol biving. So yeah, just a, a straight cruise um, past Saint Andre, up the Dormiers, up to sort of Lac de Serpensant, where we camped up here, and then the next day we flew down here. But just such good fun. This is the spot where we where we camped, uh, Lac Noir, and this is the following morning. Uh, it's just a, a wonderful spot. So nothing terribly ambitious. Um, but just an overnighter. We didn't even have tents. We just, I had a bivy bag and a mat mattress that went down <laughs> every half an hour during the night. So it wasn't the best of night's sleep. Um, so yeah, the next one was a couple of years later. Uh, um, again, in the same sort of area. This, this was the time when, yeah, I got up early, uh, like three o'clock in the morning at home, flew from Bristol, Nice at 10 o'clock, on the hill, courtesy of Marcus, uh, at about midday, took off about one. Um, and then I flew with, yeah, Marcus flew around for a bit and Bruce Goldsmith was, happened to be there as well. Um, but from, from about here onwards, I was on my own. Then I met up with Nigel here. I could see him on Fly Sky High and then we were on the radio and we crossed over from the Dormiers to the Morgan. Um, and then over here, we were together sort of pretty much all the rest of the way. So we, we um, 
yeah, we camped up here first night and then then here. And then we flew to Briançon. And then the on the Wednesday, well, Nigel unfortunately bombed, but I, I managed to fly back to Saint Andre. And then I had a few few more days before I was meeting my wife um, up here for a, a few weeks in a camper van. So I um, I then flew out here. You'll see the, the reason why. And then hitched all the way up to here and then made my way from here up to um, Lac de Aigbelair. Anyway, yeah, so this is a, those of you who've flown at uh, Saint-Jean or, um, or um, uh, what's that place called? saint vincent les Four, just on here. We'll, we'll recognize this view. It's the Lac de Serpenson. And I'm just sort of soaring up the Morgan. And it is so beautiful there. It's just lovely. It's a wonderful place. And then we had a bit of a crux move, which um, I've, I've crossed a few times now, but on this occasion, um, it doesn't really look like we're going to make it. Yeah, about 50 feet to spare. Um, and Nigel, yeah, he was the same. And you get past there and you just greeted, uh, after a while we, yeah, we, we got a thermal right back up to 3000 meters. This is about six o'clock at night. Well, at night, in the evening. Um, and it's just beautiful. Um, this is the ski resort of Orsiers. And we, we landed somewhere up here and, and camped uh, somewhere around here, I think it was. Um, yeah, somewhere in this little area here, and it was it was a lovely spot. Um, the next day we we had good weather again, um, and you start off with the view of the Eckrins sort of behind you, and this, the the biggest peak in Eckrins is something like four thousand meters, the Bar de Um and you've got these you know wild country. And then you get into this area, well, depending on the route you take, but you get into these areas with, with the sort of rolling green hills, real contrast. And then you're back in the sort of quite big mountains again. And um, we just cruised under this cloud street, Nigel and me, crossed over this um, mountain here, which is called La Pyramid. And then you're greeted by, uh, this is the sort of other side of it, La Pyramid. You're greeted by this lovely area here of lakes and, and sort of flat grass called uh, Massif du Telifer. And we just thought uh, it's 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 too good to sort of, you know, turn down this. We'd only, we'd flown about 60K for about, you know, three hours or something, um, but it was a beautiful spot. Plus more importantly, I'd had a, a P-tube malfunction about an hour and a half earlier and uh, everything was getting rather damp and horrible. So I was, uh, I was looking forward to a swim, one, swim in one of these lakes. And we, we landed just in this field here that you can see Nigel just there. We landed here. And uh, pretty much the first thing I did was strip off and go for a swim. And what a spot it was. I mean, you just can't find a, a nicer place than that, um, apart from the mosquitoes later on. <laughs> And the rain but yeah we'll gloss over those bits but next morning it was absolutely beautiful i mean at, you'd think the water was freezing cold but it wasn't at all it was really nice for swimming in this was in uh, july i think i seem to remember something like that uh so yeah the next that that morning we had to hike about an hour just to find somewhere to take off but it was incredible we we decided we weren't going to push any further north um, that was the original plan to sort of fly to to Chamonix, but the weather in the Northern Alps wasn't so good. So we sort of decided to head east to Briançon and um, just, it was fantastic flying in these clouds or around these clouds, um, a real sort of playground. It was amazing, but it was a, it was a funny flight, this one. Um, the first half we're cruising along at three and a half thousand meters and the second half of it, we were struggling to get above ridge height. And in fact, we were, we were low in this valley uh, between Briançon uh, and um, Les Deux Alpes. Les Deux Alpes? Yeah. Uh, I might have that wrong. Um, but the second half of it from Col de Lotteret to uh, Briançon was uh, quite 
touch and go at times. And then the, the sky got a bit, um, well, it got a bit lifty. So we were spiraled off a, low, a load of height and decided to land in, in Briasson, um, which has a lovely old sort of castle and stuff. We end up landing down on the right hand side here somewhere in one of these fields. Uh, I can't quite remember where. Um, and it wasn't too windy and we didn't get sucked up and we didn't actually get hailed on. But what we did get was a really nice meal and a couple of beers um, before we got a lift with this lovely family up to the Col d'Isard where we pitched up. And we thought we were facing a perfect sort of uh, sort of southeasterly facing slope. We thought we'd just be able to walk around to the right hand side um, and find somewhere to take off. But uh, there was a really quite a strong northerly wind, you know, i.e. blowing, as we look at it here, blowing from the back. Um, so we killed a bit of time in the refuge, just downhill a little bit. We had to go down there to get some water, honest. Um, and then, yeah, this is the view from the refuge, refuge Napoleon. And we ended up sort of, the cold desert is up on the left here somewhere. And we end up scrambling down the, this sort of slope. And then um, I think we took off from here and it was really steep and pretty difficult to even just get your kit laid out and without you know, losing anything rolling down the hill. Um, I think we took so long um, setting up and getting ready and everything that actually we probably could have taken off at the, you know, where, we, where we'd camped, um, but just facing, facing north. But anyway, we eventually got off okay. And I had, uh, look at this. I mean, this are conditions to actually, you know, to die for. Had a fantastic sort of five or six hour flight back to St. Andre. Um, and in the end, just got up to about 3000 meters and then had a sort of 17 kilometer final glide back to St. Andre, which is, which is here. And about an hour after I landed, um, the heavens opened and it just poured. Um, so that night back in Nigel's place, um, this is a, the old, an old chateau that he, him and uh, his partner Carol were renovating on behalf of this sort of wealthy Australian couple. Um, and so I had a very nice sleep and shower and clean, you know, wash after, after that. So that was it for Nigel. He, he had to um, call it a day then. The next day I wanted to fly north again, but by you know, midday, the clouds were, were looking pretty big. So I just ended up flying out towards Dean and you can see here some shower, big showers there. And so, yeah, just get out of the sky pretty quickly. And I managed to get a lift all the way to Valois and then walked up the hill to Puy Ayard. And here you can actually sort of, I was camping on the takeoff spot, but the next day was way too windy. And so I ended up having about a 12 mile walk um, up over quite high pla uh, coal, I can't remember what it's called, but, um, and then down to Serre Chevalier, and then a little further hitch to the Col de Lotre, where I uh, pitched up for the night. And, uh, magnificent spot. Next day, I actually hitched to uh, Le Alpe, Alpe, uh, Alpe Duet, I think it is, rather than Les Deux Alpes, Alpe Duet. Pitched there and took off and had a really nice flight for for most of the way. It was interesting. The cloud base was sort of over 3,000 meters to start with. And then halfway into the flight, it got down to 2,000 meters, which meant I never got across this. Well, I got across this valley, but not. I, I, there was a really strong valley wind blowing down here. I end up um, having a bit of a torrid time before landing down in these fields on the left hand side. Yeah, it was just the wind was blowing along it and it was just rough and nasty. So that was the end of that trip for me. Um, I, I hitched and uh, met my wife in the camper van and we, we um, spent the next three weeks driving th through France and Switzerland into Italy in time for the, uh, the comp at um, Feltre that year. So moving on to the uh, next year. This was the sort of precursor to the Gumball. So this was um, just over a week long. Similar sort of route, similar sort of views. You'll, you'll recognize that view. There's the Lac de Serponçon. 
<coughs> there's that coal which we scraped over uh, the year before. These are these uh, rounded sort of lovely, well, fairly gentle green hills. This is a sanctuary, uh, sanctuary Notre Dame de la Salette, a sort of monast well, not a mon monastery, but a, the, uh, the female equ equivalent, I think. Actually, it might be, I think it's all both monks and nuns. Um, and yeah, I landed just on the side of this hill here and what a spot it was. Uh, absolutely beautiful, slightly surreal hearing singing coming from the monastery um, in the evening um, whilst enjoying this perfect sunset. And I just wandered down the hill at one point to get some water uh, past the shepherd's hut. And here was a shepherd, a chap called Nicholas, I think I remember rightly. Um, and he was such a nice guy, early 20s. Um, he spoke a bit of English, I spoke a bit of French and he, yeah, I got a load of water from, from him. And then uh, later on, he wandered up um, that evening, brought a big chunk of, uh, you know, chunk of cheese and some apples. Um, all I could offer him was uh, a little bit of my whiskey and um, some of my crunchy bars or one of them. So yeah, we had a, it was just a beautiful evening. Uh, it was lovely. The next day met up with the guys again, uh, Steve, then there's me and Minsek and uh, Rich Chambers. <coughs> and we, we hiked for about an hour, took off from pretty much here, I think, glided across this valley onto this slope here, where unfortunately Steve um, ended up in the trees after a, a little accident. Um, he was okay and he eventually called, pressed the SOS button on his inReach and uh, was airlifted off because, I mean, he was fine, but uh, it was just a pretty awkward, would have been a long, difficult walk down. I pressed on and the others, you know, uh, Minsek and, and Rich pressed on, but they, they didn't get us, uh, they bombed fairly early on. It was a pretty difficult flight. This is coming up to us Grenoble there. And it was a bit of a tricky sort of place here. Quite low cloud base, as you can see over here. Um, and I'm quite low. I end up sneaking around the side here into a bit of a headwind. Not brilliant landing options down here. But once around here, it was just a sort of cruise up up the, the um, other side of the, the valley, uh, the mountains there. And then by the time I got to opposite Saint-Hilaire, the sky had completely changed and, um, you know, wasn't going to get much further, but we we decided over the radio on the on the you know during the trip to meet up at Saint Hilaire, and I managed it. I flew, uh, I just I got all the way across the valley, but just didn't have enough height to top land. So yeah, again we all met up, <coughs> and we actually stayed at campsite this time. The next day, quite low cloud base, but brilliant place to fly. So spectacular. And then you're heading north up towards, this is the uh, Boge Mountains. And this, you need more height than we had, which was about 1800 meters to get, to get north. Um, there's a valley wind is blowing left to right. You wanna sort of um, get, sort of get, uh, aim, aim for here, get across here, um, where the slope is a bit more into wind and then soar up here and then make, make progress northwards. But we were never gonna do it. And I, I end up landing in one of these fields down here on the right hand side. But every cloud has a silver lining and we all regrouped by this lake. Um, beautiful lake for swimming, really nice and warm. Um, great spot actually. We had a campfire that night. Yeah, terrific. And then next day hiked up to Mont Lambert and it was really stable. You'd think with the valley wind blowing up towards Albertville, which is up here, um, you would have thought this slope here would have, you know, you'd just get onto it and just soar right up to the top, but no way was that happening. It never got above the tree line, but it was a brilliant flight. So much fun, only about 30K. But like here, oh God, I, I remember this. And I really, I mean, there are plenty of landing options. And I 
thought I was going to be landing in one of these fields sort of down here, but I managed to just scratch the lift out of here, got onto this slope and then um, eventually, uh, I didn't, haven't got pictures, but eventually made it into uh, Eugene, which is sort of just at the uh, close to sort of Dusard, sort of in between Annecy, uh, uh, Albertville and Dusard. And so, yeah, we all had a day, a rest day in Dusard, really. Um, Minsek went off, went off to fly with some of his mates. Uh, Rich and I just chilled and ate some salad and <laughs> healthy food for a change. Before that evening, making our way up to Sambui, which is, it's got to be on anyone's, if you go to Annecy, you've got to check out Sambui. There's a chairlift which takes you up and it is just a beautiful spot. There's not huge spaces to pitch your tent. There's only, it seems to be this sort of little grassy area here. Um, it's really sort of undulating and, and rocky, but there is this refuge here, which we'll see again in an, another trip, but it is, it's such a, a beautiful spot. And that's the view from the, from the takeoff at uh, the lower takeoff at Samboy looking uh, sort of north, uh, northwest. Uh, over. I said come over because I can, See what's going on. I was just going to go on Zoom on that, but oh, I need to. Oh, Nathan, maybe you can mute. Yeah. Um, so there, yeah, this is looking over the uh, Lake Annecy with the Tournette here, Four Claz somewhere around here, Les Dantes here. Beautiful. And the thing about Sambui, it's if you climb up to the Col, and it's only about 200 meter vertical, takes about 20 minutes. Um, you get such a good launch pad for morning flights heading north up the Aravi, which is where we are now. So this is this is the Aravi, um, and it's it's a sort of standard route if you want to get into the Chamonix Valley and, and beyond. So this is that this is at no, the northern end of the Aravi, sort of uh, I think it's called Point Percy, more or less, heading across to the Varan um, above Salange, which is here. Or is that Salange? No, this is Salange, I think. Um, Mont Blanc here. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty easy glide, about seven or eight k, and you 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 land, you end up uh, arriving somewhere around here, and, and normally it's a pretty easy climb. Then it's a cruise down the Chamonix Valley, past Mont Blanc, past uh, Lac Demesson, I think it is. We're actually in Switzerland at this point, um, and then. Then it gets a little bit tricky is how you get into Switzerland. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about routes here, but it went well for me this trip. And um, I'm sort of heading west on the south side of the Sion Valley here. Um, I don't know what those mountains are particularly called, but I end up having a 175k flight that day. Uh, and this is the Al Aletsch Glacier, the biggest one in the Alps, um, and Fisch is just up this valley. The sort of fish takeoff is up here. And I landed uh, somewhere here. Yeah, I landed just in this field here. And I'd spotted this hotel here and I thought, I've had six hours in the air, I'm gasping for a beer. But would the bloody <laughs> landlady, whatever you call her, manager, give me a beer? No, no, it was too late. She was shutting up, wouldn't even sell a single beer which was a bit disappointing. But once I packed up, found a, a spot, um, any thoughts of a beer sort of disappeared. I mean, what a view. I, I was gonna sort of try and camp in this, you know, where I'm standing, but actually there were a load of cows uh, roaming around. So I ended up fi finding this um, in that little hut you saw in the previous picture. It was sort of fenced off with electric fence. So I just managed to sneak my tent in right in the corner here to keep out of the way of the cows. Uh, but it was a great spot, really lovely. And then the next morning went for an ice cold swim in this little lake behind it. God, absolutely took my breath away. And then um, final day of that trip, um, I flew with, uh, Robert uh, Smith, um, who lives half the year in Andermatt. And this is the, uh, this is not the glacier above Fiche. This is um, 
can't remember what it's called, but it's basically the source of the Rhone, this, this glacier. Maybe it's called the Rhone Glacier above the Grimsel Pass. And then <clears throat> made it to Andermatt, um, where I'd actually flown, I'd flown past here the previous year and the wind was, there was obviously very light winds the previous year, gentle, um, you know, thermic winds blowing up the, the southern, south facing slopes. And um, I was thinking, ah, the same, it's gonna be the same again. I was looking at these uh, windmills at the top here, which you can just about see. And I was desperately trying to work out um, which way they, you know, I was trying to work out if I could, if I know which way they're turning, do I know, kind of work out where the wind's blowing? And for whatever reason, I got it wrong and ended up flying here into a sort of area of rotor and had a, was tossed around for a little bit. Um, and I thought, okay, that's it. I've had eight days, uh, let's call it a day here. And I landed just down, you know, um, I'll just go back. I just landed down in this field here in Andermatt. Um, I, I soared here for a bit because clearly the wind was actually blowing from the north coming up this valley hitting here and I could I could have soared here all day but base wasn't I, I just couldn't find a good climb to get to make progress so that was the end of the trip but going back to the wind turbines the rule is if you if you can see them turning clockwise um, then that means the wind is blowing from from you towards them um, so that just try and remember that one. If they're going clockwise as you're looking at them, then the wind is blowing from you towards them. And that applies to all wind turbines. They're all, all like that. And yeah, check it out for yourself. Uh, so I actually got a lift with, um, yeah, I wasn't flying. Yes, yeah, I was flying with Rob, but he, he landed earlier. Um, and so he, he gave me a lift back, back to Grimsel Pass and, um, I, I pitched up here for the night, beautiful spot. The next day looking a bit uh, bleary and uh, <laughs> um, rough after eight days, I sort of just made my way uh, to a, I just found a takeoff to glide down the valley. The forecast was for strong winds. And I went past this sort of obviously memorial to, uh, to a pilot, which was uh, quite poignant before taking off and just gliding down the valley and landing right outside the co-op. And look at all that fresh veg. I've never been so excited to see some fruit for ever before. And so I made my way back to Geneva Airport where I met up with Rich again for about the most expensive beer I've ever, ever bought anyone, um, but it was worth it. It was great catching up with him. Him and Minsec had, um, had Minsec had gone home a day early and Rich had had a couple of days in, in Chamonix or a day in Chamonix. Um, I think he had a, a quick flight there. So that was that trip. I need a swig of beer. Um, so this was the little little bonus trip in 2019. Just a, like a weekend trip this was. Um, but it was brilliant. I, it was it's just crazy you can you know leave the airport <coughs> bright and early or leave your house bright and early in fact in this in this instance i i dossed down the night in bristol airport because it would it just didn't seem worth getting up at three o'clock um so i slept in, in costa at bristol airport there were some british lads on the, on the same plane and they gave me a lift um from from geneva to annecy they dropped me off at the plafay takeoff it was pretty stable to start with, um, <clears throat> but eventually I managed to climb out, got above the dance, and then headed north, well, north, um, northeast. And it took an age before I got up to 3,000 meters, but eventually I did. Um, and just the one I did, because there's a big valley crossing here, this is Clues, and you have to get across this little ridge and then onto the ridge behind here. Um, oh, I can't remember the name of the, there's a ski resort there. Um, snuck, yeah, got there really low, climbed up just about. And then next stop was Avoriaz, which is this ski resort here. Um, and I hadn't been here since 
I think 1998, where that when there was a British Open here, or at um, Morzine, which is across the, the valley to the left here. And one of the tasks that during that comp, I remember we were scratching along these cliffs trying to get height. It's like, you know, a hundred of us all beating, you know, scratching up and down here. Um, and eventually we, we sort of got a bit of a climb here. We had to take photos of, of, uh, of a building um, in those days, no GPS. It was all done by photos. Uh, so it's pretty difficult to find the right building. You just had to sort of hope you had it in. I remember on the way back, um, Guy Anderson, he had a big collapse and the, the glider went right in front of him. As it came back out, it uh, whipped his helmet off uh, and the helmet crashed down on one of these chalets. I don't know if one of these chalets down here or I'm not sure where it was. Um, <laughs> he, he, in his pal, uh, may he rest in peace. Um, he, he was a safety officer. He got on the radio to Guy say, you've got to land, you haven't got a helmet. <laughs> So that was, uh, so I think Guy dined out on that for a while. Um, but yeah, look at this, it's beautiful. Got up to 3000 meters, sort of a bit further on. Here I am, this is Lake Geneva. This goes down into the Martini Valley, down here, the sort of windiest valley in the Alps. But at this point it's nice and wide. Um, I've done about 70K, I suppose, or 75K. And there's some quite big clouds developing here. And I was hoping to get across here onto these hills and then just carry on up here. But I got across here and it just didn't work. So I found myself landing in this little village. Um, and I landed actually just, just, just there by that little shed. Um, and I thought, oh, I'll just camp somewhere here. It looks pretty nice. And just as I was packing up, this couple came out who owned a, a b and and said, oh, We've got no guests. Why don't you camp in our garden? Um, there's the website, a little plug there. Good skiing nearby. And yeah, it was really roughing it. Uh, they had a little plunge pool. Um, and yeah, super couple, um, Paul and Catherine. So yeah, the next day, uh, quite a, Reese, you'd like these. Um, had a Pretty nice walk up for about three hour hike up to the takeoff, passing all sorts of mushrooms, which some of them are edible, I'm sure. And it was gray and cloudy, but the sun eventually came out and I had a really unexpected uh, flight for about 40K and end up landing up this valley, um, just about sort of 30 or 20 kilometers from, from Spitz where I was trying to get to. Um, this guy, he didn't speak a word of French. Uh, I don't know what language he spoke. He must have been German, but it didn't sound like German. I think he was sort of Dutch or whatever, but this is a, a valley called Farmelberg and um, the advanced guys say the, it's pretty incestuous out there. Uh, so maybe that they got their own little language. But anyway, he gave me a lift up the hill and I eventually uh, pitched up in this accommodation for the night. So not quite as luxurious as the night before. But it started pissing with rain and so I was very glad to have a roof over my head, even if inside was was a little bit basic. But there was this amazing sort of 15 minutes when the clouds just rolled up the valley. I've got a time lapse of this. It's in the video of this of this flight and they just rolled up the valley and spilled over um, this this sort of ridge here. Just beautiful. Anyway, the next day uh, I had hoped to just be able to sort of at least climb up the, the hill behind and, and take a glide, but it was misty and raining and blowing and it was clearly on. So I had a, a pretty epic uh, 21 mile walk, mainly downhill, which um, I guess is easier. Uh, down to Spitz, uh, yeah, I think it took about nine hours. I was absolutely knackered by the end of it. Um, so the point of all this, which I didn't really explain terribly well, but was to meet up with the uh, various friends of Advance to celebrate um, the you know advanced success in the X Alps uh, in 2019. So I got a cable car up to Nissan in the morning, and actually you could see that because there was so much rain the night before, the cloud base was really low. But we were meeting up 
somewhere on uh, yeah it's on the idea we had to meet up here basically for at a sort of mountain uh actually it wasn't really a restaurant it's more just a, a cheese farm um so i ended up just gliding straight across here there wasn't a thermal to be found at that point met up with the advanced guys here we got Toma, Kriegel, uh, Aaron and Patrick. Yeah, so it was worth it just for the selfies. And we had a pretty, pretty nice mellow evening actually, as you can see what a spot that was. So yeah, that was a really nice little, um, you know, well, four, four day trip. Um, just, you don't need to go for epic long trips, you can do short trips. And this, that brings me on to this little mission <laughs> two years ago. Thought it'd be fun to do one um, on the south coast. The forecast looked good. Um, in the end, I didn't do quite as much as this. I almost, you know, almost could have made it to Sidmouth, but it was just too windy by the time I got here to, to take off safely. But yeah, I'm just going to flip through this, but ended up I'll just go back to the map. This is Ypres, uh, down near West Bay, near Bridport. Flew along this bit, hiked 12 miles, and eventually, yeah, uh, down to here. Camped here for the night, hiked here the next morning. But yeah, like I said, it was too windy. Um, so I ended up getting a lift, uh, yeah, back to Ypres or West Bay and end up flying around here. Actually, the wind had dropped by that point. But yeah, just a you don't have to go to the Alps. You can don't have to do it in the summer. Uh, just be a little bit creative, really. Um, this is where I camped. <laughs> Wasn't quite sure where I was at night time when I arrived at eight o'clock. But the next morning, woke up to this lovely view. A uh, bit of a hike, and then yeah, this is flying later on that day after I got back to eat. So yeah. Have fun on those little trips as well. And then we'll rattle through this one. This was last year um, with eight of us on the gumball. Started in Saint Andre and then cruise up the, the Dormiers. Uh, this time I was camping, camp with Reese at Col de Palestre. So a little bit of a different place than Orsiers, which is just off to the left here. And then, yeah, 140k flight north up to landing in Eugene again. A day in, it's funny, it's very similar to the year before. A day in Dusard when the weather wasn't quite so good. Then up to Sambui again, where I bumped into these guys um, who were doing a Volbiv course with a school called uh, Ecole Carpe Diem. And they're based, I think, around the Annecy region. So they were, they were all pretty low airtime pilots doing a, a Volbiv course, um, but just using single skin gliders, which was quite a nice idea. So the, uh, they weren't going for XCs at all. They were just basically taking off in the morning and gliding down, um, but they seemed to be enjoying themselves. And the reason why we, we were all sheltering under here, we slept under this refuge as well, is because there was a really heavy rainstorm at one point. But here we go, the next morning, beautiful day. Um, heading up the Aravi again. Um, went past Chamonix and then the move I made the previous year and got down to Fiche didn't work this time and I end up landing in uh, one of these fields here. Yeah, just uh, this little grassy bit right there. Oh no, this bit here, right here. Um, this is renowned as one of the windiest valleys in the, in the Alps. Um, so you want to be very careful when you're landing here. Um, I had checked before I had to make a decision um, what the wind was doing. Um, I used the Meteor Swiss app, which uh, you can get sort of, you know, wind readings from various wind stations in the valleys and, or, and on mountains. Um, and it was about 20k an hour. So it was quite okay landing here. You know, I wasn't going backwards at any point. Um, but I wouldn't have wanted it to pick up much more. So this is the Rhone Valley. So where we saw the glacier in some of the early in the early pictures and features up the other end, far end of this valley. So the, the Rhone flows down here into Lake Geneva and then all its wends its way down to the uh, south of France. 
Um, and then we had a day of bad weather and I pulled the family card. I, I remembered my uh, my brother's wife's family have a an apartment in Verbier, so all right, I'm not camping for two, in two days of rain. And then Chris met up with me the next day, and we um, we had the night uh, in in the apartment. So I had two nights there, drinking wine and beer, and generally chilling out. The next day, this was the sort of uh, in terms of distance and and uh, you know, hours in the air and spectacularness. This was this was a you know the flight of this trip, 190k down to Bellinzona. Um, just you know, stunning scenery. This is crossing over from the Sion Valley into the Erola Valley, um, and you basically follow this valley all the way down here to Bellinzona. Um, just beautiful. But then you land. I landed low. I'm, I'd set a goal in, in, you know, in the landing field at Bellinzona. And then having got there, I thought, oh, it's not such a great place to really camp. Because I thought the next day wasn't really going to be flyable, so I didn't want to be high. That's why I landed low. Um, but I did eventually find somewhere in this sort of linear park between the river and the town. And actually, it was fine. I was, it, was, it was pretty quiet. There was another, um, someone else wild camping. Um, I think they were cyclists wild camping in, in the park. Um, the next day I started hiking. I was going to hike for something like 2,000 meters vertical to get to find somewhere to take off and glide. And I, I walked about a mile or two and then thought, this is, this is ridiculous. Um, especially as, as I looked to the, uh, to the west, I could see actually the sun was coming out. So I turned around, went up to this uh, takeoff at Mornira, which is about 1,300 meters um, above Bellinzona. And it's a beautiful spot. And actually, as somewhere to camp, it would be perfect. In fact, Chris, who um, he camped here the night after I was down in town. Um, but there's a river, and you can have a swim or at least a wash. Then the next day, actually, once I did get airborne, I mean, it turned out it was just such an unexpected flight, really, because I was expecting just a glide, you know, after a big hike. Um, and it turned out really good. I did 100 kilometers that day, uh, including having this really great sort of few minutes with this eagle. Um, we were thermally together. And then at one point, he just tucked his wings in and just dived out of the sky. It was quite incredible, the speed he, he just, he'd obviously seen something and he was just focused on it entirely. Amazing. Yeah, so you, uh, this is Lake Como, I think, um, the sort of northern end. I'm looking, actually, looking back, the word came, looking west here. I'd come from these mountains, and I'm just trying to get a bit of height here, which didn't work. But eventually, I, I ended up here, Monte Padrio, which was a beautiful spot um, on top of this hill, looking west, uh, just a perfect spot with a few goats and sheep. Have you ever seen a sheep with such long ears? Um, it just, yeah, they would, their bells were just tinkling away all night. It was, it was really lovely. Uh, next day, about 60k, flying past these old World War, World War One fortifications, I think they were. Um, a really beautiful moment of cloud surfing halfway along that flight. And then I landed and hiked a bit and was met this little family who were uh, bivvying up there with their kids in one of the refuges. Um, further up the mountain. And in fact, this where this bench is is where I stayed for the night, just inside this little fence. It wasn't electric, but just to keep the horses out. There were, th there were signs everywhere saying, watch out for bears, but I never saw any. Uh, so this is the next morning and this was the view. So pretty heavily inverted, as you can see, but had a great flight. Um, Every now and then you come across these, now there's a word for these, for this, I can't remember what it is, where you see faces in, in sort of, every, well, inanimate objects. Um, but it was a really challenging flight, just really scratching. At one point I spent an hour scratching up this one slope just to gain, I think about 400 meters in the end. Uh, slow and persistent, um, you know, patience was the order of the day but some spectacular views. This, this is also on the 
not the main Dolomites. It was on the edge, you know, it's to the southwest. Of the, it's called the Dolomiti de, del Brente. Um, and it's pretty spectacular. The, um, the recent, I say recent, I think September, the uh, Dolomiti Man event. Um, Dolomiti Man? Or the Fly Dolomiti? I can't remember what the, the hike and fly event is, but that goes all around here. Um, and I landed and I, I was just about to try and hitch or find a bus or something. And this guy rocks up on his motorbike and turns out he was, he was a paraglider pilot. So I hopped on the back of, of his motorbike and he uh, gave me a lift um, to a place where I'm going to get a, a, a bus ride. And I eventually made my way to the Vicio Terme. So his lift and then a couple of bus rides and I was, I was in Vicio Terme. In time for a swim in the lake there, which was lovely, but the trouble with towns, again, it's really difficult to find somewhere nice to stay. So I ended up um, walking up the hill out of town a bit um, and just finding this garden of this house that was being renovated. Um, so it looked a bit of a tip, but actually it was fine. Uh, it was quiet and it wasn't disturbed at all. The next day, again, it was really, it was stable as hell to start with. Uh, I lost half my height, you know, and losing about 500 meters uh, or no, maybe more I can't remember scratching around the the trees to get a bit of height and eventually um, I think oh, how many, was it about 40k that day um, I ended up in this valley um, not being able to get further because cloud base was too low it had been about two and a half thousand meters at one point and then by the time I got further east it was down to about 1600 or 1700 and there was just no way I wanted to get to Feltra, but there was just no that wasn't going to happen. Um, and it was a bit rock and roll at <laughs> down this valley. Um, so I end up landing uh, in this field here, actually. Um, and um, it wasn't too windy. I figured because my the reason I went for this valley, I figured because it wasn't a main valley heading sort of north into the main alps that it wouldn't be that windy it's more sort of an east-west valley and yet there was some wind but it wasn't wasn't crazy windy um it was perfectly safe yeah so i landed and sort of thought uh the last couple of nights i've been so hot and been bitten and uh i ended up having a swim in the river and just thinking oh, i'm gonna call that a day so i hiked um to the nearest town and there's always there always seems to be bars opposite the bus stops, which was uh, very convenient. And ended up getting a bus to Bassano and uh, stayed with a friend of a friend's in Bassano, right by the landing field. Um, and that was the end of that trip. But the, the flight back from, from Venice was awesome because we went right over this, all the places that had flown the previous days. Here's that valley I was telling you about, that, that east-west valley. I, I landed somewhere just... Uh, yeah, somewhere around here, I think. Um, then the next slide. Yeah, these are the Dolomiti de, del uh, de Brenti. So this is the valley I flew down the day before, and I landed here and then hiked up to here and took off from here. Um, and then finally, a fantastic view of uh, of Kent as as I, as I came in. So that's enough of my trips. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the kit now. Are we okay for time-wise, Mike? Another five minutes or so? Yeah, go for it. Five, ten. Um, so there's an awful lot of kit here. Um, I've got it all logged in a Google spreadsheet if you want to find out what I've got. Um, um, and just a sort of idea of, of weights and things. Um, I've got it grouped into various sort of categories almost 24 kilograms with with about three kilograms of water um but of course you're not carrying all of that you're wearing some of it um and like hiking poles don't count because you obviously you know you're not carrying them so in terms of what i was actually carrying including water was about oops uh would have been about 22 kilograms which ain't so bad so we got my kit list in this link and I'll, I'll, I'll produce a PDF of, of some of this, maybe without all the pictures, but with some of the links. So my, uh, yeah, my kit list is in here. And then 
Reese Fisher put together this communal sort of um, kit list where if you want to benchmark your your kit against uh, everyone else's, um, you can just open this and add a, a new a new tab for your own kit, and he will, um, you know, work to work out the averages and uh, see how you compare. So yeah, that's that's most of the kit sort of laid out. Um, I'm not going to go through it all. We're sort of running out of time, but we've got a, a separate page on sleeping, sleep system. So this is it is important to have a bit of comfort out there. Yeah, it's important getting to sleep, getting as much sleep as possible. Which I mean, I, I don't think anyone sleeps brilliantly in a small tent, um, but you may as well make it as you know. Give yourself the best chance of it so yeah i've got this um down quilt which is really nice it's not as restrictive as a sleeping bag i find um that was about 80 quid from aliexpress and the i think one of the best sleeping mats is the thermo rest neo air x light i'm sure quite a few have got this one um when it's blown up it's about five six centimeters thick it's pretty it's pretty good actually it's very comfortable so i'd recommend that but tent wise um i've been using this this tent um uh, for the last three years or so and it's 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 pretty good the only downside of a single skin tent obviously is that you tend to get condensation in it um so next year well i've just ordered one it hasn't arrived yet but i'm i'm going to try out one of these which is basically a i mean it looks it's basically a tent but it's a sort of more of a tarp type tent you can either you don't have to use the, the inner mosquito net thing um but it rather than just having an open front it's got this extra sort of uh, flap here which if if you are in bad weather will keep the rain out and give you quite it's difficult to see from these these photos but i'm hoping it will give you quite a decent sort of area to put your kit in as well um so yeah i'm looking forward to the, that arriving as that's about 80 quid um, again from aliexpress flight avionics <clears throat> yeah so anchor solar panel i've i've found that having a, a solar panel that's charging up a spare battery whilst you're flying works really well so you've got i've got two of these anchor batteries so one is powering the the phone um, during flight and the other one which i would have used the day before is being recharged so when you land i, I always found it was fully charged um, after i landed um, so yeah here's my xc tracer 2 flam so that's solar powered so you don't have to worry about charging that up at all uh, there's a battery uh, yeah and a Garmin InReach Mini uh, for tracking and sort of emergency and just messaging if you've got no mobile signal. As I say, I use iPhone with Fly Sky High. And just, I've got this little uh, picture of a video camera up here to remind me of the story of how I got this picture. Because I have the, the camera, my GoPro mounted on my helmet. And you wouldn't normally be looking down like this. But I found this latest GoPro, well, it's a GoPro 8 actually, there's a 9 out now, but it's, it takes great uh, video, but the firmware is a little bit flaky, especially when it's, when, you, when it's connected to an external battery. And I just couldn't get it, uh, get it working, it wasn't turning on, I didn't know if it was on or off, but it, whatever it was doing, it wasn't doing anything. So I had to take, this was the first opportunity crossing this lake to actually take my helmet off. I had to take my helmet off, um, open the back of the, or take the sort of foam cover off the, off, you know, the wind slayer off, off it, open up the battery compartment, take the battery out, and then plug it back in again. Um, and then finally, as I put, you know, finally it was working, and I, this, this picture just got, you know, got uh, taken, or this film got taken as I was putting the, the video camera, or my helmet back on my head, hence the sort of angle of it. But actually, it's quite a good, uh, it's, it worked out quite well but yes um uh, so that's a bit disappointing but in terms of the the firmware i've done a couple of updates since then i think so maybe it's fixed i just haven't had a chance to really try it 
so yeah that's some of my trips that's the kit hopefully by now um you're feeling inspired and want to oops, go out and um you know do your first vol biv so how do you how do you take your, those first steps um well it, it obviously depends on your experience i mean i had tons of experience but I, it took me ages to get around to doing one um so i mean like i say you don't have to go out to the alps to do it you can just have a great time even in winter in this country but uh, scotland i mean you guys up there you're blessed with some of the best flying in the world really so okay the difficulty is stringing together two or three days of good weather but if you do get those you know beautiful high pressure um sort of system setting up in spring then i mean i'm going to be up there like a shot if i can to try and uh, do a little scottish vol biv um, so yeah, you, the thing about Volbiv, it's not all about the XC flying. You don't have to have XC, you know, epic flights to have a great time. Um, it's all it's all the people you meet on the way, the the, the hitchhiking, the the hiking, um, just spending time with your mates. So I'd say if you've got um, over on the left hand side, if you've got lots lots of comps experience and you've been on sort of independent holidays uh, to places with a mate, couple of mates as opposed to guided holidays and you if you if you're flying 100 kilometer mountain cross countries then um join the gumball this year or um or just plan your own trip with with some friends um in the middle here if, if you've done sort of three or four comps and you're flying sort of 75 kilometer mountain xc's um then again join join the gumball for uh, you know company and mutual support i mean it's, it's i stress it's not organized you have to be an independent pilot but sometimes what you just need is the the comfort that you're not going to be alone out there uh, if you've only done like one or two guided holidays in the, in the mountains and you you know you're doing sort of sub 25k uh xc's then you want to try have a go in you know in the uk first go down to south wales um or or, or Scotland or the Lake District or somewhere or Snowdonia and just just have a bit of fun there um, or join a you know do a Volbiv course um, so yeah what is the Gumball Trans Alps Rally so it's it's not an official event it's just a group of like-minded pilots flying and camping together um, nothing's organized it's just you're just there for you know mutual support and the, and the crack um so you, if you're thinking of joining you've got to be an independent pilot you, you're not going to be wanting to be um don't expect to be guided so the first one we did was as i say last year with eight or nine pilots um next year you know assuming we can get out there in mid-july um we're going to start in saint andre and we've had a lot of interest this this year and who knows we might even get 20 or 30 pilots which would be awesome but i guess we'd it naturally form into little pods of pilots of similar levels um so if you're interested just drop reese a line um there's his email address there reese at unvanity.com this, this sort of brings me on to a, a little tiny plug for a volbiv course that reese and i are putting together um this year it's not really a course it's a, it's a season-long coaching uh, progression course so we've already started with with four pilots um doing zoom sessions each week or every every two weeks it sort of varies it's normally a, a week of present you know a week going through a particular topic and then the following week is a exercise week um you know doing setting some tasks not not physical exercise um you know route planning or or stuff like that um and then we're going to have uh three week-long trips over the season june july and uh, august or september we haven't decided yet um so if you're interested in that get in touch with reese again or, or or with me um as i say it's we've got four pilots we're only looking for one more place we don't want to it's the same pilots we're working with the whole season long and the, the guys who, who are on it are typically around about the 50 to 75 hour mark um, so 
we're not looking for really experienced pilots. These are pilots who've been out in the mountains a little bit, love the idea of Volbiv um, and want to, you know, progress rapidly. As a, there are other people who do courses. These, these are the guys um, I mentioned who I bumped into in Sambui in near Annecy, Ecole Cup Diem, um, and uh, this this one Alpwind.fr. Uh, Marcus King did a, a weekend course with them. Uh, so some resources if you want to um, find out more. So we've got the UK Volviv Pilots Facebook group. I've got a ton of videos on my YouTube channel. Greg Hamilton's got some great stuff on his on his YouTube channel. In terms of weather on the go, I haven't really touched on that so far, but Meteo Parapont is great. Soaring Meteo, Meteo Blue, Meteo Swiss. There's apps for, for, uh, for those, well, Soaring Meteo isn't an app, it's a website, but the others, others have all got apps. Planning flyxc.app is great. You can see the routes. Um, um, obviously, Google Earth as well to, to sort of visualize the terrain you're going to be flying over beforehand. Uh, kit we've got in those Google documents that uh, I mentioned before. And these are all links on here. So, like I said, I will um, produce a PDF of these. So yeah, if, you, if you've got any doubt, just uh, don't hold back, give it a go. Even if it's take small steps first, no need to try and do 800 kilometers across the Alps in your first trip. Um, just have a fun overnight camping in Scotland. Why not? So that is that is it. Over to, uh, there may be a ton of questions in the, in the chat, which I haven't seen. Um, I'm gonna stop the sharing now and hand it over to you guys. Tim, that was brilliant, uh, really uh, inspiring and uh, just fantastic. And uh, it's a great approach to flying that I think. Um, yeah, it's completely liberating, not having to get worry about getting back to your car or catching a train or anything. Having you, your kit with you is is fantastic. Um, and certainly, you know, if I go, if I'm lucky enough to get up to Scotland this year, I'll just have uh, you know, have a kit with me, have a tent with me and a, and a sleeping bag. And it doesn't matter if you bomb out or if you land in the middle of nowhere, you know, you can just, if it looks great, just keep on going. Yeah. Okay. There's a few questions. I'll, ju I'll just scroll down and see the ones. Uh, were you picking your camping spots from the air from real Neil rolling? Hi Neil. Um, uh, in, in some places. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, we were not the exact spot necessarily. Um, but yeah, we on some of the trips we had ideas of where we wanted to to you know to camp at. Um, other other times we'd been there before, like Osiers, I'd, I'd camped before, so I've, um, so so people camped there. People were aiming for there on this latest trip. I Reese had been to Calder Palestre before, so this time I made it across there and camped with him. Um, but yeah, the the massive de Telefer, um uh, it just, uh, Nigel had sort of looked at the maps before and figured that might be a nice place. But when on my own, um, like that place near Fish, uh, I just, yeah, I saw that from the air. I mean, I knew I wanted to land there. What you're really looking for, not it's not necessarily a camping spot, but is somewhere where you can take off again the next day. I mean, that's, that's, that's what you're looking for. So somewhere with a southeasterly or, or, or south facing slope so you can you can get away the next day even if that involves a bit of a hike and i mean to, to be fair a lot most places in the alps you're not gonna have to hike for too far to find somewhere to, to launch cool and robert andre mickelson uh are you guys overloaded on your wings when doing volviv and if so by how much um so i'm a little bit overloaded probably a couple of key kgs overloaded when i've when i've done this last year when i did the dragon hike and fly comp i obviously sort of didn't I carried as little gear as possible and i i was about uh, i think about 103 kilograms normal xc flying i tend to have a little bit of ballast and i just carry a bit more clobber so i'm about 106 107 maybe and Volbiv, I'm about 112. Um, 
So it's not that much more because a lot of it you're carrying anyway. And um, I got rid of a little bit of back protection and the, the big foam pad underneath the, the seat in my Lightness 3. So you can, you know, you can take less as well of your, of your normal. Life. I see that uh, Reese has actually answered quite a lot of these. Yeah, I see questions. that. Yeah. So he's done a pretty good job for you. Paddy, Paddy's moaning about the weather in the Alps. Paddy, you should know the weather in Scotland's a lot worse than the Alps. Yeah, yeah. Um, kit list, blah, blah, blah. About that. Beer, bearded vulture, bird spotting. What size wing are you on from Molly Bear? Uh, I've got the size 24. The three, and I'm, uh, I weigh uh, around about 87, 88 kgs. A question from me, do you prefer doing a trip on your own, you know, for the isolation thing, or is it better with mates? I, I think a mixture is perfect. I mean, that isolation is quite special when you just like that, that day when I had that unexpected flight after the, after the big flight and I, I flew 100k and ended up at Monte Padrio was just such a lovely spot and just yeah beautiful evening. But on the other hand, it would have been super nice to, you know, have a couple of others to share it with, you know, it's, you've got to be, be, you've got to be comfortable with your own company. Um, uh, but after, after a, on, on this last trip, yeah, I spent, the last sort of four, four, five, four days, I suppose, and I, you know, I was, yeah, I could have done with a bit more company for sure towards the end of it. But, you know, other people are different. You know, some people do big solo vol bibs um, and, and it's, you know, they're totally happy, but, you know, it's horses, it's just whatever suits your personality, really. And here's a good final question from Ben Wiley. Do you prefer hike and fly to XC? Oh, well, they're, do you mean just pure? I mean, Hike and Fly, I see Hike and Fly and Volbiv are sort of a little bit different. I would say Hike and Fly is, to me, is, is more what you do in the autumn in the Alps when you just hike up and have a lovely, you know, smooth fly down autumn or winter. So if, if the question is really Volbiv versus XC, then Volbiv really, because I mean, you get the XC element, but, um, you're not just it's just so much more than just the flying it's it's all the other you know, adventure that goes with it does that answer your your question ben uh you mean competitive xc i've just seen you um yeah i haven't done the league for a few years now i got a bit bored with that um mainly because a if you if you're busy and you can't get out on those really good days you just feel like you're losing points you know you never catch up and also because of the, the rules, you know, they can be quite strict at times. Um, and like last uh, two years ago, we had the North South Cup in the Lake District, and on the on the Sunday, it was like the best conditions ever in in the in the Lake District. And there's like five and a half thousand foot cloud base and hardly any wind. And uh, we all did triangles. I did a 65k triangle, um, but right at the end i just touched down briefly as i was sort of just scratching up blees fell and um i took off again a minute later but that would have i would have if i'd been doing the league then i would have lost like 200 points um and i would have been gutted it would have spoiled it completely for me but as it was i wasn't doing the league and uh it didn't make the slightest bit of difference i took off again and and and, and finish the triangle and so yeah um i mean i record my flights on x contest for sure it's really nice having a record especially on x contest because you can you've got this sort of flying buddy um system so you can you can see other people who who f you flew with that day um so it's great for comparing tracks but yeah i, I don't miss the competitive xc bit at all brilliant well tim on behalf of everyone um Thank you so much indeed, that was fantastic. And uh, at this point, usually on an LLSC club night, everyone would go off for a piss and uh, to get another beer. So um, not suggesting everyone does that, but it's a good point to...